I feel the liftoff. The clock has started. Roger. Welcome, everybody, to the inaugural episode of the Punk Rocker Moon Stomper podcast. I'm Amy Shira Title. Some of you may know me from my own YouTube series, Vintage Space, and my blog, but some of you probably don't. And um, joining me, as will always be the case, is Jason McClellan. Introduce yourself. I'm Jason McClellan, and I will be joining you each episode. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This, <laughs> this is our little... Um, all the things that we have in common that we really like seem to be things that not a lot of people also like. Um, and they weirdly go together for us. So we thought we'd hang out, talk about punk, ska, space, pets, and beer, and share it with you guys. And perhaps some <laughs> other alcohol, too. We'll see. But, yeah. Uh, we'll yeah, see no, they nicely go together for us. So why not have a podcast about it? Absolutely. Kind of absolutely. Thought. Well, because alcohol is such a big part of this podcast, let's go ahead and start, Amy, by talking about what we're drinking today. I I know it might be cheesy, but had to go with something that uh, is perfect for me and perfect for a space-related podcast. I'm drinking a Harpoon UFO, so, you know, it's the best I could come up with last minute, but a Harpoon UFO... Which is a good beer. I ended up in Boston a few months ago, and you, I believe, either texted me or left a comment on Instagram that I should have a Harpoon UFO, yes. and the bar at my hotel happened to have it, and it is a delicious beer. So I first yeah. was introduced to it um, when I lived in New York, and they don't have, Harpoon doesn't distribute on the West Coast or mm -hmm. out West. There are very few states they're actually in. Um, if you're in Florida, I think, or New York or Boston, you're pretty safe. But other than that, their distribution is pretty limited. And I'm in Phoenix right now. Why do I have Harpoon UFO? Well, they did like this sort of test distribution, I guess, at um, Select Total Wines. And so Total Wine right now in Tempe has like cases and cases of it. And they've had it for a couple months. And the last time I was in there, they had a sign that said, last chance to have Harpoon UFO. So... Of course, I grabbed it, but I do love the beer. They have a lot of different uh, varieties, too. And I think when I was in New York and first found UFO, they only had like three different flavors. One was a raspberry, one was their regular, and one was maybe they had launched their pumpkin at that time, too. But pretty damn good beer. It is a good beer. And isn't there another, isn't there a tap room in Tempe that has some of the best beer selections in the city? Well, well, I guess it's pretty universal now. Every city seems to have, you know, craft beer explosions. So yeah. <laughs> they have all these you places did. that love to have the taps full of local right. beers. There's so many local breweries. Um, I was just at a brand new brewery last weekend that it's not brand new. It's new to me. I haven't been to it yet, but it's called Wilderness Brewing in, mm -hmm. I think technically it's Gilbert, Arizona. Um, they, be, they brew a bunch, I don't remember the number, but a bunch of their own beers. So many that my wife and I went and, uh, we got two samplers and I think their samplers had maybe five, maybe six each. And we still hadn't gone through all of their beers and they do a lot of interesting ones too. I'm a big fan of sours and they actually mm -hmm. had a couple of sours. So it was fun, but really good beer. And we'd heard from a lot of people that that's the place to go if you, if you like craft beer. So tried it out, was not disappointed. Nice. Nice. What are you drinking? Um, top. Tops, tops. you're thinking of tops, place. yeah. That's the one I was thinking of because, yeah, I, I did used to live in South Tempe, which was not the greatest place to live. But um, I am drinking the Stone Mocha IPA. Um, I really like Stone, and I know I know that their stuff is always delicious. And the idea of an I, a Mocha IPA with, a, yeah, a style-defining double IPA with cocoa and coffee, I'm just like, this sounds weird because when you think of cocoa and coffee, you think of a heavy style, right. which is not nice and delicious and warming especially in winter although winter is not a real thing in los angeles it's still can go outside during the day without a sweater right so don't really need the coziness of a stout but this is surprisingly light for something that has a mocha coffee aftertaste but it's not super hoppy like because the stone delicious ipa is one of my go-to's because it's everywhere 
in LA and it's so good. It is really like kind of smacking you in the face with hops, but not that bad. This is super easy to drink, like dangerously easy to drink, but delicious. It's just really smooth and kind of has a bit of a chocolatiness to it, but it's not overwhelming, which I like. That sounds amazing. Yeah, there's a oh. little there's a little uh, wine store across the street from my apartment that always has just one long fridge with interesting rotating selections of craft beers and odd things. And, you know, they get they get a certain number and then they don't order it again. So it's sort of like you never know what they're going to have. So I just go in and I just, yeah, well, this looks kind of neat. Huh, OK, if I like it, I have to buy all of it. Well, they have it because I don't know where else to get weird beers around here. That's, you know, across the street. It's so convenient. Weird beers. <laughs> weird beers. I do like some weird beers. Um, That's not awesome. Always. I like it. They're not always like a it. win, but <laughs> um, you can't find brews. the good ones unless you're uh, adventurous. So exactly, yeah. Home brews are the weird beers that you don't necessarily want to experiment with, but um, yeah. No, Sometimes no. I will admit to buying beers based on a good label, um, like the Elysian Space that. Dust. Yeah. Um, Elysian Space Dust. Have you tried that one? I have not, but I've been lured Cause, by that label. Right, right. Because you're not an IPA fan. Right. Um, I tried it. It's it's delicious, and I 100% was like, hmm, Space Dust. I like space, and there's dust, so why not? And it was a it was a good choice. There's a brewery here, and I forget, I forget who it is. There's so many here now, but one of the local breweries in. Phoenix in the Phoenix area has one now and I think it's called something like moon juice hmm. or something something moon related and the art on it is like a moon buggy and something I've nice. been been tempted to try it haven't tried it yet but nice. uh, yeah those things call out to me for sure yeah yeah have you tried I know we're dwelling on beer for a bit here but That's have you fine. tried um, <laughs> there's no rules um, Ninkasi's uh, ground no. control no I haven't so <laughs> hilariously my first ever sponsor on my YouTube channel was Ninkasi because they wanted someone who could talk about the space element of this beer so That's awesome the, the, gimmick of I mean not really a gimmick but it was brewed with yeast that was launched into space it was 75 awesome. miles I think um which is super neat and they had to you know they had a failed launch but the whole you know brewery team went out to watch the suborbital rocket go up so I did five episodes about suborbital rockets living early experiments of living grains and living things in space um and I forget what else but um they send me a bottle every year as thank you for promoting their product that's and so bringing cool. it to the audience it's so good it's like a nice. nice it's a stout that's not super heavy and it's just like I still have my bottle from this year because it's one of those ones I think it's like forty dollars for like one of the 1.6 pint big bottles hmm. it's it's not a cheap one that you just like buy willy-nilly so I, I always wait and drink mine for like something exciting that happens there's so. a brewery that i keep telling myself i'm going to go see next time i'm in san diego and that's intergalactic brewing again because of the name i'm I've already in love with heard it of that one, yeah it's but really small I know. it's huh. really small but uh yeah they're they're in san diego and uh i found out about them a little more than a year ago and i still haven't been but they're I pretty pretty do. geeky they've got geeky names on on all their beers uh, but how could you not like a brewery called Intergalactic Brewing? And you would expect a company called Intergalactic Brewing to have geeky names for their beers. I mean, that would have to be part of the thing. You don't call your brewery Intergalactic if you're not just a little bit of a space nerd. If you don't, uh, then what's the point? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, because then you're just like jumping on the space is cool bandwagon, and which leads me to ask, has that ever been a bandwagon? I was just going to say, <laughs> is that a bandwagon? <laughs> I think it was a bandwagon in like 1962. But that's all all I can think of in terms of, yeah, is, uh, yeah. The only thing I can think of with the space bandwagon is, uh, you know, the girls at the Cape in Florida trying to sleep with all the Mercury astronauts. Yeah. Well, maybe, there, the maybe there'll be a new, new bandwagon cool. sometime. It'll, it'll be cool again. I guess that does happen with some things like the um, I was in Pasadena for the Curiosity rover landing on Mars in 2012. And there was a landing party the night before the landing because the landing was at midnight. So they couldn't have a party start at 2 a.m. Not to mention the engineers had to work. And there were all these kids dressed up like rovers that are like, we're landing on Mars for the first time ever. And I'm like, no, we're not. How do you, <laughs> none of you know the history of Mars exploration? But you're dressed like a rover. So it's that like, yeah, there's a bit of space bandwagon. Yeah happening that night 
it was pretty it was pretty weird it was a weird night anyways but <laughs> popularity comes and goes and you know ska music is the perfect example of that for sure <laughs> yeah oh, which um you that was like that was a good segue because i was going to bring up the segue of the other brewery that i never try enough because they never i never seem to find it is ska brewing which i've had a couple of their beers well i'll just say it now i've had a couple of their beers and i've liked it but it's never something that they seem to carry in really? bars near me or yeah or in um the liquor store near me where i can just go pop, like pop over if i want something it's um yeah it's not a brewery that i see a lot of but everything i've had of theirs i like but i also inherently like it because it's ska brewing yeah that's interesting to to hear that because mm -hmm. my experience has been um with their distribution i see it everywhere so and in, in multiple Phoenix. states too oh yeah huh. for sure they what well, i think one of their their big reps lives in phoenix um, and they do a lot of sponsoring of ska events here. Um, they have a big, big present in Phoenix for sure, but Colorado, obviously that's where they're, they're based. Mm -hmm. Um, but even in Idaho and, and weird places too, I've seen it. So, which strikes me as odd that Idaho, the other thing that I find weird about beer just in gen and liquor in general in the States being from Canada is the way beer, liquor, wine distribution works, it's not just in the form world. of like of like breweries being able to distribute out of state or not. And like all, like I know a little bit about how that works just from friends who work in these industries. But um, when I lived in North Carolina, it was super weird that you could get certain beers in the grocery store and wine, but liquor you had to get at the liquor store next door. And then there was a separate beer store for anything above like a 4.5 uh, ABV. Yeah. Just like who make, and these laws are all by County because yep. I lived in Maryland last summer for the new horizons mission. And depending on where I drove from the lab, it would be like, you'd have to go to a separate beer store or you could go to the grocery store. It's just yep. like, I don't understand how any of this works. It's so confusing. And, you know, if you don't yeah. do a lot of traveling, I guess you're never exposed to that. I remember, you know, the first few times I experienced that, I was all, oh, so when you go different places, it's a legitimate thing that I really yeah. need to yeah. pay attention to, find out where I can get I alcohol because it's not, where not as easy. <laughs> like, yes, there's a grocery store right there. Yeah. That doesn't mean you're going to be able to get what you yeah. want. Yeah, I lived the, the yeah, past, past couple of years in me. Idaho, and that was totally a thing that I wasn't prepared to deal with. Yeah. You know, they have their, you can get beer and wine in the grocery store, but alcohol, you've got to go to a liquor store. Yeah. And they, and those states, at least in my experience, are the ones that never have really fun, weird alcohols. Like I bought, my last whiskey purchase was this little brewer, uh, distillery in San Francisco that does whiskey in the style and in the manner of craft beer. And I don't even know what that means, but it just sounds so San Francisco. It really <laughs> uh, does. I had to try it. And it's it was the only bottle that wasn't like $400 and yay big. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was just sort of like you would never be able to find that in a liquor store in a state like North Carolina where all I could ever find was your stock you know, from your low end Jack Daniels to your blue label to whatever else gets more expensive than that. So I have, I've never tried. I have endless fun, you know, going to places like Bevmo and Total Wine, just like spending an hour walking up and down each aisle, looking <laughs> at all the weird beers they have, all the weird whiskeys, things that you've never heard of, but look fascinating, have really yep. fun labels. Um, that's great. But even places that have alcohol in the grocery store, you know, our Kroger store here in Phoenix is Fry's. So you go to Fry's, they, depending on which Fry's you go to, have an incredible liquor section and you walk and see all sorts of weird things yeah. there. And they'll even carry local things, you know, things that are, are mm. brewed and distilled locally and have little signs so you can see the local brews. Um, that's, that's really cool, really fun. That's something that I definitely miss out on, especially yeah. when I'm going places with these weird laws, because that's part of my great fun in traveling is trying out the local alcohol scene, the local beers. <laughs> yeah, I know. As bad as it sounds, that's also a thing that I do when I go to a bar. I'm just like, I'm not going to get a California IPA when I'm on the East Coast. Like, I'm going to see what's local that I can't readily get. What's like the weirdest, most unique thing that you have on tap? Okay, I'll take one of those. It's, yeah, why not? It's interesting. It's more fun to see what uh, what the locals drink and how the locals live. I'm with you, yeah. and I, I guess I'll throw this out there, disclaimer, we're not alcoholics, we just uh, are alcohol <laughs> we just enthusiasts, appreciate. we're alcohol enthusiasts. 
we're not alcoholics. We're just enthusiasts. I like that. I like that. Um, people have described me as a science enthusiast as well. So I will just take enthusiast as the blanket term. Um, yeah. Just use that as your official title now. Just enthusiast. Yeah. It covers everything. Enthusiast. Yep. Yeah. We. I've, yeah. That is a good disclaimer to make. <laughs> Well, back to Ska Brewing for a second. Uh, yeah. I have been really impressed with their beer, um, and I love their story, too. Just these people who were Ska enthusiasts, you know, and took their love for Ska and love for beer and blended it together. And, you know, that's how breweries start, people taking their love and passion yeah. and and actually realizing it um, doesn't always work out so well, but Ska's had great success. Mm -hmm. And they've done collaborations with uh, different bands. Uh, they do an, a big annual nice. party I haven't been to with their big anniversary celebration. They'll have bands out and have a concert at, uh, I think they're in Durango, aren't they? I don't remember where in Colorado. but Durango? Uh, yeah. Odd, but okay. It's a, a, a beer location, as is pretty mm. much everywhere in Colorado. But Yeah. Yeah, I think... Um... Yeah, I don't know much about Colorado, to be totally honest. I have skied there, and I've been to a couple conferences there. And walking through downtown Boulder uh, was the first time I'm sitting glass outside City Hall smoking joints. It's just like, you guys took it. It was like right after it was legal. I was like, well, you guys took that and ran with it. Good on you. It was just like this weird first time I ever saw an oxygen bar as well because hmm. what? That was that was an odd one. It was yeah. like coffee shop, cafe fancy restaurant, oxygen bar, regular bar, like, hmm, flavored oxygen. That's a thing. That's a thing that people want to pay for. <laughs> I, I've, I've never tried this. I, I laugh at it. But apparently the one thing that that could potentially be good for, and this is a good science thing, but uh, it's supposed to be good for hangovers. That I, I have actually heard. I yeah. have actually heard um, EMTs will do that, that with their hungover and they have to work, that they'll just put themselves on pure oxygen for 10 or 15 minutes and it helps their body process everything that it needs to process and then they can, they're fine in like half an hour. I so, see those things in, yeah. in uh, the, Maybe that's the why I've resorts seen them in, Vegas. Up in Vegas. And, you know, I always, I always think for half a second, well, maybe, no, no, I'm no. not doing that, no. Yeah, there's there's a limit to like the odd stuff that I'm willing to spend my money on. And mm -hmm. when I look at like, I don't know, I just can't with the oxygen bar. I'm just like, I don't think this is going to be a thing that I should spend. It's like 40 bucks too for like a, for air. like a, like a, bre like, I don't know. What do you call it? It's not like a tasting, like a smelling, like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And sniffing sounds bad. So that I does sound know. very bad. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, well, should we take the the segue that we've hit on like four times now of ska brewing to go into our individual reasons of why we kind of fell in love with punk and ska as a genre? Because I yeah. think the reasons of falling in love with alcohol is pretty universal is you drink and it's kind of fun and then you develop a palate for it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I got, I got nothing. Yeah, it's, um... <laughs> we don't need a reason to explain our love for alcohol. Yeah, but... beyond that, I mean, again, not alcoholics, just enthusiasts. But um, yeah, yeah, beer. I've always I went out for drinks with some girls from my kickboxing class yesterday, and they're all wine. And I'm just like, I can't. Never been like that into wine. It's like for some somehow I developed like a beer palate where that's my go-to. Yeah. Everyone has their thing, so I, I can certainly appreciate wine. Um, yeah, and. You know, happy to drink it when it's available. I'm um, not going to turn it away. Unless it's yeah. a Chardonnay. Chardonnays are pretty disgusting in my opinion. But <laughs> buttery Chardonnays. Like, uh, I can, I'm not, like, I can't tell. With beer, I can tell, like, specific, like, profiles and little intricacies in that just because I, I guess I drink more of it, so I'm more aware of it. But sure. with wine, all I can say is, like, this is a good wine or I don't like this wine. Like, that's as far as And you know, when it comes down to it, that's all you really need to be able to yeah. determine. Like, yeah, is I've this never... good to me or is it bad to me? Am I going yeah. to drink it or not? So. Yeah. And there's few wines that I'm ever like, Ugh. Yeah. But yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty much the same way. You know, I'm, I'm happy to drink wine, but uh, if I have my choice, I'm going with something else. Yep. Yep. I'm with you on that. All right. So I guess go ahead and I'll let you go first. Um, <laughs> I guess we don't need to separate ska and punk. We'll just kind of no, talk they're, they're our, sort our, of... our music music adventure in, independently. So uh, yeah. how did you get into the punk and or ska genre? 
Which is funny because I actually have two very distinct moments where I fell in love with both punk and really? ska. Like, oh, wow. yeah, I have one of each very weirdly. Um, yeah, I feel I feel like, th- I mean, this is like the trip down memory lane story where it's like, I was an awkward, nerdy kid. Surprise for what I do for a living now. Aren't you still? Um, yeah. It's still very much the awkward, nerdy kid. But like, um, my parents are older. Um, so I was raised on like early Beatles and Buddy Holly and like 50s, early 60s. Um, and I still love that. Like Buddy Holly is still one of my favorites, but, um, yeah, it was like growing up there's not my, my family is so quiet. Um, it's very weird. Like in my parents' house, I'll go home and I'll be working and I'll like to, you know, take the headphones off and it's just silent. I'm like, is anybody here? And like everyone's home. It's just like no one does anything with any noise. So there's never like music growing up in my house, but my mom gave me, I'm going to tell the long version of this story now because I'm in it. <laughs> um, my mom gave me Sgt. Pepper's for, from Beatles uh, for my ninth or tenth birthday. And like it was the first time I'd ever heard an electric guitar like that. And it just like changed my life because I was like very much like a kid in the 60s. I was raised on this like happy American apple pie. And then I started exploring other things that sort of had like a harder sound, which took me a while because that was my starting point. But I think it was my friend Sam gave me a CD. He he was like the, the cool friend I had. I've known him since we were six months old. So he was the one that was like like, here, try this band. And like, my parents are always so mad because he would give me things that were loud. Um, but he, I think it was my 15th birthday. He gave me a CD called Amy's Punk Mix. And it had a little stick figure of me with my nose ring, stick figure of him with his glasses and a stick figure of a little punk with a mohawk. Um, and that like, that was just how I started finding bands. Cause like he put Jimmy World on there and the Ataris and Pennywise and like all these other things that I can't even remember what it was there. And then it was like, you know, you start buying it's like, oh, I like that band. Well, oh, they're on this compilation. I'll buy that. It's like, oh, I like that. So let me buy that. And then you just sort of like, you know, in the late 90s, early 2000s, you buy CDs because <laughs> we're old. Um, yeah. So it was just like I started sort of compiling it together. And then it was sort of as I got into teenage years, like I was awkward and not smart enough to be with the smart kids in high school and not cool enough to be with the cool kids and like not popular enough to be with the popular kids. So it's just kind of like there. And then it was actually... Um, it was like through through kind of like exploring punk music and going to shows that I found that sense of community that I just was lacking in all the things, you know, like when you're in high school and you just like don't have a group to stay with. It was just sort of like, this is weird. You, you know that feeling? Yeah. So it ended up being like going to shows where like I would just I was 15. What did I care? I would jump, jump in the pit. I felt like I was immortal because when you're 15, you don't believe you can be physically harmed. That's right. Um, but it was always and maybe it's because Canada is so nice. But like every time I got into a mosh pit, someone would throw an arm around me and make sure that I wouldn't die. And it was like nobody cared that I was like slightly overweight and super awkward and like refused to wear women's jeans because uh, yeah I was just always in like baggy everything it's like I feel like I'm at home here um so yeah that was like sort of when I fell in love with punk was sort of exploring more of like the whole scene and the music has always just been something that was like I don't know I can't even explain like why that sort of spoke to me I guess but yeah it was just kind of falling in love with like that community and then Scob came second to that I saw uh, same friend, Sam, who made me that uh, that mixed CD, he and I went to see Bad Religion and Less Than Jake was opening. And I didn't really know. I'd listened to a bit of Less Than Jake, but not much. And then I just remember like standing. I, I'm four foot 11, right? I wasn't any taller in high school. <laughs> and I'm standing there in this like throng of people. And it was right after Hello Rockview had come out. And like as soon as they started, it was just like the entire room just like whooshed forward and like I don't think my feet hit the ground for like 15 minutes and it was just like insane I was like this energy is infectious and I always want to be here and then that was when I was like oh my god and it's just horns and you can't not dance when there's horns involved and that was when it was just like this is just too fun and too happy and like so much more interesting than like I can't even think of what the competing like pop stuff was in like the year 2001 like what was even popular I don't know Backstreet Boys was that a thing happening at that time I guess yeah, it was just like this was so much more fun and more interesting and we had like just instantly like made you a part of something else. That's a fantastic That's story. story. <laughs> yeah, I like it. That's my story. And I'm actually it's funny. I'm seeing Pennywise tonight. So I'm coming full circle on that today, and which is a Pennywise song. That's awesome. I'm like not even a huge, huge Pennywise fan, but yeah. like because that was one of the first shows that I saw that I was just like, this is a community. Yeah. And like 
could jump in and knew that I was going to be taken care of by people who were just like, you're here and that's what matters. It's like, yeah, it doesn't matter who you are. It's always been like the most inclusive, like love in. It's just like, yeah, I like that. Yeah. And I don't know. I mean, I think it's, the scene seems to have morphed slightly over the years because I remember the, the same feeling, you know, and, and seeing pits be the same Same that you described, you know, you'd get knocked down and people would help each other up. And, you know, I mean, they were certainly not shy about, you know, slamming the shit out of you. But at the same time, it was a community. And that's just, you know, what you were doing. And you were all doing it together. And, and if somebody got out of hand, people would kind of straighten them out. And, (laughs) you know, but I think that's, that's, I don't see that as much anymore. But that makes me sound like an old, crabby old man like back in my I, day. I, yeah. I still see it. I mean, I don't I don't go in pits anymore because, frankly, my face is like 80% of my job. And I just don't want to get knocked to the floor, stepped yeah, on, smart. and end up with a black eye. Um, but I, I will get, like, right up to the front. And I will get, like, close enough to the pit to be, like, shoving people back in. And it's just, like, it looks really violent from the outside. But I've just, I'm just, I'm so aware of it now for some reason, yeah. probably because I'm not in it, that, like, everybody in there has, like, a stupid grin plastered on their face because yeah. they're having so much fun. And it's just, like, I just love the energy at those shows because it's, like, nobody cares who you are in your regular life. It's, like, you're there and you're in it and you love it. And therefore we want you to be having fun with us. Yeah. Like it's just such a, it's the nicest environment in its weird, aggressive way. When, I don't remember what year it was, when I, (laughs) I can sort of remember the first time hearing ska music and I, I want to say it was Buck 09, but (laughs) you know, I, I was really, really weird and awkward and you know like like all of us just trying to figure myself out um pre-high school and and right into the freshman year of high school um didn't really have a lot of musical experience uh to that point because coming from a hyper religious family background really the only music that i was familiar with was jesus music and where did you grow up i don't know that now that i think of it so i grew up um in very very far west side of of phoenix out in a little little area called buckeye which is not so small anymore but back back then there was absolutely nothing i remember my, my family moved there when i was like two years old and i think we had to drive like to West Phoenix for groceries because there was no grocery store. So we had to like pack the cooler with ice, you know, back in the day of living in the wild, wild west. Uh, <laughs> yeah, good time. So, okay, sorry, um, go on. No. no. Um, so I remember when I got my, I don't know if it was when I got my first job or, or when it was, when I had some, some cash for some reason and I started buying CDs of my own because I had no idea what I was doing. I was just exploring and I would go to, the mall and go to the the record stores that used to exist in malls um, and look for cool artwork really and you know just try to guess what kind of music it was and I you know I'd listen to the radio and remember certain songs I heard and pick out things that way but I had accumulated accumulated like a collection of ten or so completely weird CDs that didn't go together you know mm-hmm. ranging from like Blues Traveler and Mariah Carey and I don't know, it's just weird shit. Yeah. But, um, and my best friend, um, I started spending more time with him because, you know, going to high school and I was going to high school out of district. So, um, uh, doing a lot of carpooling and things and started listening to more music that was outside from my house. And, uh, you know, that's really where I was introduced to it. I think I heard it and it was kind of unlike anything I'd ever heard before. And it was really cool. And, but his musical collection is really what got me he started to starting to explore um, the other music that was like that. You know, he, he, in his heavy rotation at the time was like, like I said, Buck 09, but also Social Distortion um, and even kind of weird shit like The Doors and stuff that really started me looking into, you know, other types of music and you know, classic rock and things like that, mm-hmm. too, that kind of is related. But... I remember when we went to our first show together, it wasn't his first show. He, 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 his older brother always went to concerts and I would hear the stories afterwards and I was really jealous. Um, so one night I 
told my parents, well, I, I guess I actually did, but I spent the night at his house, but uh, doing so so we could go to a concert. And, you know, we were far west side kids and we, we had to travel the vast distance to Tempe to go to a show. And the show was the specials and the cherry pop and daddies. And <laughs> that's a great show. <laughs> and it was a small show too. It was this small outdoor venue in Phoenix, um, maybe 300 people there. So that was really cool. And that started my love affair with the cherry pop and daddies and have since become friend with, friends with those guys. But that started me on my journey of just sneaking out and going to shows any chance I could. Um, and then, I don't know, this seems to be a more common road than I would think, but I took my love for music and just going to shows all the time and then decided, how can I be involved in this? Well, I'm not really a musician. I could learn, but eh, I'm not going to learn. So maybe I'll approach things from the business side. So I'll start a record label. So I started a record label, um, you know, which entailed talking to local bands and saying, hey, right. do you want me to put out a record for you? And I don't know why anybody would listen to me because I was just a kid and I had no money. Like, who the hell am I? But yeah, sure. So, <laughs> you know, I put out, a, put out a few CDs, put out an actual seven inch vinyl record. That was a fun experience. But then went from there and decided, oh, hey, I like this. I'm dealing with all these bands. Why don't I produce concerts? Sure, why not? So instead of taking baby steps and maybe working with some of these local bands that I'd worked with, what did I do? I said, hey, I'm going to book the toasters. So I somehow got the to convinced the toasters that in. like, hey, I'm some asshole kid from Phoenix. And I want to put on your next show. So did that. Um, it was kind of a nightmare disaster. But, uh, you know, they, I don't think, saw it as a disaster. And they're still friends. And <laughs> But you pulled it off is the important part. <laughs> yeah, pull pulled it off. And then, of course... Going with the other idiot uh, mistakes or steps in life and that progression, we'll decided. Steps, well, I'm <laughs> I'm doing doing concerts. Why don't I have my own my own uh, concert venue? So opened a concert venue, and did that for a while. So yeah, I'm essentially retired from the music industry now. But uh, I had to get my foot into a little bit of all of it, and yeah. really the greatest takeaway. I mean, great experiences wouldn't change it for the world. But, you know, building those relationships with the bands over the years, just yeah. it, it, priceless, priceless experiences. Yeah. I love that you just jumped in and decided to start putting on shows. It's like, sure, I can do this. Why not? Well, the thing I guess <laughs> that really prompted that was I was tired of spending money to go to shows and like seeing one band I liked and sitting through like four or five right. other bands that I didn't right. know or didn't care to see. Um, so, well, why don't I just hand pick the bands I want to see? But sometimes the way to do that that's is to put a way on the show. to find, yeah. But sometimes that's a way to find bands that you would never be exposed that to. That is absolutely right. I, absolutely right. my most recent experience with that was I, I mean, I've, I've ended up in some weird places. I ended up at a Snoop Dogg show once. That was a weird story. But I ended up um, seeing this band at a, a reggae festival, like a ska reggae festival um, called Pantan Rococo, which is like a Mexican ska band. And they kind of fuse ska with salsa. And I don't speak much Spanish. Like, I can tell you what's in my backpack and tell you that Beto Chavez is muy guapo. Like, that's my high school Spanish. Um, but this band is just, I don't know, 15 people. Mm -hmm. Like, it's huge. And it's awesome to the point where I was like, I'd go see them again. And I've seen them like three times because they play LA a lot. It's just like, this was the weirdest thing that like, I did not go to see this band, but they were just at this festival. And it was so much fun that I was like, okay, this is fun. I'm glad I experienced this very weird thing that I would never have gone to normally. The Latin ska scene is so huge and it's an experience for sure. I've seen, I've seen some incredible bands, you know, just like you described, 15 people, whole Latin percussion section. Mm -hmm. It's rad. I really, really like them. And it makes me um, it makes me really want to understand a little bit more of what's going on politically in Mexico right now, because, again, not speaking Spanish, I just see that there's the figureheads being like, you know, just like put up on the display behind the band. And I'm just like, what? I wish I knew what you are rebelling against right now because yeah. you're really passionate about it. Everyone in this room. I don't know what's going on. Just random, yeah. random uh, side note here. I saw recently that there was this gigantic ska fest in Mexico City. It was put really? on by Pepsi. <laughs> <laughs> 
I don't know why it's so funny to me that Pepsi no, it's would kind put of epic. on a ska fest, but like maybe that's it's a that weird popular choice. in Mexico. Yeah, I don't know. Weird. Um, yeah. Very weird. I don't know. Who knows? But um, yeah, it's kind of interesting living in LA to have a lot of people that have traveled up. I actually met two girls at um, I saw some forty one a couple weeks ago, which is like total nostalgia right being from yep. toronto and like i think the first time i saw them play was at much on demand which was like you go down onto the street and you look in through the window and then they play it through the speaker system outside it was not yeah it was like super super local and small before they like exploded and then we're opening for blink Wayne too a year later um but i i met two girls from mexico at a show two weeks ago they drove up from mexico city wow. just to see them in riverside it was just like that's commitment good on you girls like that was awesome yeah that's hardcore wow yeah it was a good show too it had been yeah many many years since i skipped prom to see them it's a good choice good yeah choice. I, it was it was uh no it was an epic show it was jimmy Eat world sum 41 green day and blink 22 that's pretty awesome like what would you pick those four bands right. which is like like some of my like Jimmy World and Blink White too. Like I love Jimmy World, um, but just like not really punk, but sort of. Somehow they it ended works. up in that space. Yeah, like I, I don't really know how they ended up on that bill, but I like don't either, but... I don't really know where Jimmy World fits. It's interesting the bands that kind of fall into certain genres. You're all yeah. well. It doesn't really fit musically, but I guess it does because that's where they've been. So. Yeah, because I feel like, I don't know if you are a, much of a Jimmy World fan or not, but like their first album, Static Prevails, is like way different from anything else they did, especially because it was followed by Clarity, which is like super moody and amazing. It's probably my favorite album of all time, but like I could see how Static Prevails would end up like in more of the punk scene, but then they've kind of expanded into this more like, I don't know, all of their music is just like expansive and like atmospheric almost like it's very odd it's like very hard to place with anybody else i love that aspect of angels and airwaves just this big kind of grand atmospheric music yeah uh, yeah you know s some of their songs are you know sort of kind of on the the punky and you know a little hint here and there of blink 182 but yeah it's different but it's still good i like it yeah. And that, your, your Jimmy World comment reminded me that I think I mentioned it to you, but when I was at that brewery last weekend, oh, um, yeah. Jimmy World did a, did a co collaboration with them. So they've got a Jimmy yes. World beer. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard about that from friends of mine in the Phoenix music scene, which is so funny that I have met so many awesome people in Phoenix and in that scene in Phoenix, like literally three days before I left the state. Yeah, you forever. ran away. Yeah. I did not have a chance to experience any of this when I actually lived where all of this is happening. Yeah. But um, which is super weird because I've since gotten to know Jimmy World. Um, it's a shame that I didn't when they were playing small yeah. local shows in Phoenix when I lived. I lived yep. like That's three miles from their studio That's too. That's how it works. Um, but yeah, no, it's um, yeah, I've heard about that beer, and you said it wasn't bad. Yeah, I liked it. it. But you said it's an IPA. and It's that's an IPA not sort of and, you know, style. I'm not an IPA guy. Mainly yeah. because, I mean, there are some fantastic IPAs. And the more accurate, I guess, statement is that I don't like hops. I don't like hoppy beers. So mm -hmm. the, the IBUs on a beer are, are pretty important to me. So I love when a place, uh, you know, put on their menu the IBUs of, of the beer. Yeah. Um, but there, there are some, some IPAs that, uh, you know, are pretty low on the bitterness scale and, yeah. uh, be quite delicious and unique. I mm -hmm. will say that about IPAs. They, they, are, they vary a lot. They vary a lot. I think, which is why I gravitate towards them. Cause you can figure out like one IPA is going to taste completely different from another. Yeah. Whereas for me, like wheat beers kind of all have a very similar profile. Sure. Yeah. We're back on beer somehow. <laughs> That's going to happen a lot, especially because we're happen, drinking. Especially but... as we're drinking doing this. Yeah, um, that's right. Yeah. Cheers to that. No, you got it. Well, mm -hmm. we've covered music briefly and yeah, we'll talk about it much I more know, because that's what so this whole say, podcast but... is about. We don't need to do the entire series of yeah. the podcast in one episode, but I guess let's move on to space because yeah. I, th I think you like space, right? I, I do kind of like space. I feel like the, the natural lead into that is that you're drinking a UFO beer, which is UFO very beer. fitting for you. Go. And, yeah. you know, I will um, mention that uh, our mutual friend, Ryan Sprague, um, author and playwright in New York City, um, 
did me a huge solid. And I mentioned that I can't get Harpoon UFO in Phoenix typically. Um, yeah. A few years ago, I was, um, well, for about five years, I was a organizer and technical producer of the largest UFO conference in the world. And Ryan flew in to help on uh, my AV team. And he brought with him cross country in his suitcase a six pack of harpoon ufo just for me so that's awesome it was pretty awesome and much appreciated <laughs> absolutely love yeah. ryan ryan actually it's so funny i met ryan oh like three years ago i think um and i think it was i think i put a picture up on twitter or instagram of i was shooting an interview in new york and he DM'd me on whichever platform was like, hey, you don't know me, but I'm Jason's friend and I've always wanted to meet you. Do you want to go get a drink? And that's where I met Ryan. That's and awesome. It was awesome. We ended up like, he came and like saw me off to the airport the next day and we just like hung out for so long. With Like that one drink turned into dinner, turned into more drinks, turned yeah. into like, oh, I'll see you off and we'll grab a drink before you leave. It was just like, it was the weirdest thing. And so it was because... No, I'd met and I'd met you by that point. Yeah, obviously, but like I'd met you in like human space. Um, but yeah, it was super weird that like I met Ryan and through like your UFO connections. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> so weird. The internet is an amazing place where like all of your weird just feeds into this like web of things that happen. Weird definitely happens. Yes. Yeah, I do kind of love the internet. Yes. Um, so, I mean, I have a love-hate relationship with the internet, but, like, that's another rant. <laughs> oh, we'll rant yeah, plenty being, about that. Oh, yeah. Being, being a female creator online is mm -hmm. awesome sauce. Um, speaking, speaking of UFOs, I feel like you need to start off with your space thing because we're talking about UFOs. So, like, you go from UFO beer to UFO <laughs> All space. right. So I should do this on camera. UFO space. That's for awesome. the For the, like, non-video podcast version that we're doing. <laughs> yes. We'll have to put in some, I don't know, listening assistive descriptions in the audio version only. Yes. Amy <laughs> moves her hands in a star-like fashion. Um, I do. I do. The one podcast that I listen to, I've been increasingly aware of how they describe. It's just like these two drive-time comedians in Melbourne, Australia, of all places. Um, but they're amazing. And they do such a great job of describing what they're doing because they do a lot of live podcasting mm -hmm. and live broadcasting. It's just like they did their most recent thing was like, uh, remember when you were a kid and you'd like run on a carpet and then slide down a tile hallway? Oh, yeah. They did They did an, in, a, an Australian championship of sliders. Interesting. Where they like That's got someone from each territory and had them slide. And like you wouldn't think that that would make for good radio, but it made for excellent radio for the way that they describe what was happening. So I'm like, as I realize that I'm venturing into podcast world, I'm so aware of how people describe things that are happening visually when you don't have that medium to work with. So well, I move my hands in a star-like manner. <laughs> think about, I don't know if you have listened to much Howard Stern, but Howard Stern has always been radio. He's had video stuff, but he's a radio radio show. And a lot of his stuff is guests coming in and doing things. And, you know, right. part okay. of the great fun is just them describing what's happening and laughing about it and making comments about it. But you don't actually see it. They do a really good job. So Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, well, I guess I'll talk about space UFOs. here. Um, yeah, for sure. So, I mean, I, I fell in love with space pretty pretty early i don't remember exactly when but i know in my early teen years um sci-fi was pretty important to me um you know watch the original star wars trilogy over and over and over and i had younger brothers too and that was their favorite thing to watch too so it seemed to always be on tv and well didn't we just watch this but right star trek next generation was very important to me had to watch Star Trek Next Generation. Um, and I think that annoyed other people in my house, but I was kind of religious about it. Um, so Star Trek played a, played a really big role in, in developing my curiosity. Um, at that time, living in the middle of absolute nowhere in the Sonoran Desert, um, really the only thing I had um, for entertainment that was available to me, and it's something that gave me freedom too, got me out of the house, was just kind of going in the desert and going camping with friends. So it seemed that uh, a certain, certain period of time, it seemed I was going camping every single weekend. But um, a lot of those times, you know, Arizona, nice and hot, 
just sleep out with a sleeping bag, no tent, just staring up at the sky. And great view of, of the stars. You could see the Milky Way, absolutely amazing. Kind of fell in love wow. with the sky, just staring up and, and uh, looking at constellations and seeing different things move through the sky. Um, you know, you could see satellites and things so clearly. It was kind of amazing, and I missed that a bit. But, you know, every once in a while I'd see things that were weird, things that, you know, I couldn't explain, things I had no idea what they could be. So that started my mind racing and started kind of open the door for that, that curiosity and my exploring um, the mysteries that uh, are in our world and out of our world. Um, then I don't remember at what point in my career, but this is several years ago. This is probably seven years ago now. I was presented with a unique opportunity by my employer at the time. Um, I was doing internet marketing for one of his companies, and he approached me and uh, let me know that he was a big UFO guy, loved UFOs, always been interested in UFOs, and wanted to start a separate company all about UFOs and extraterrestrial life. And I don't know, I guess some people or most people would kind of laugh at that and go, okay, this guy's crazy. But my response was, that's fascinating. Tell me more. <laughs> um, so, you know, kept the conversation going. He knew what, what my skills were and my background in video production and writing and things I could bring to the table because he wanted to start um, all sorts of different channels with his company. He wanted to do a magazine. He wanted to do a website. He wanted to do TV. So there was a lot, a lot of ideas going and all of this stuff was very exciting to me. Um, so kind of pushed my way in, kept egging him on and encouraging it. And, you know, after, after about a year, kind of formed a company and uh, just kind of jumped off. So I transferred from one company to the other and we just jumped right in and started a print magazine. Like who does that? But, you know, when you have a rich guy with money, hey, yes, Here's let's have answer. fun. So... <laughs> Um, yeah, we started a, a print magazine that turned into an internationally distributed print magazine all about extraterrestrials and UFOs. Started a website that we updated daily with news about UFOs because UFOs and extraterrestrial life are in the news every single day. Um, mm -hmm. And also, we built the, like I mentioned, the largest UFO conference in the world, which was tons of fun. And the greatest fun with that, see what we did was... This guy's a, a smart business guy. Um, he decided that, you know, if you want to get the attention of this field you're entering, the field of UFOs, this established field, um, get the get something that's already established and has an audience. So we acquired the largest conference at that time. Uh, I don't know, I'm not sure if it was the largest. It probably was, but it was certainly the longest running. Um, it had been going for 19 years, I think, when we acquired it. Mm. So we acquired it for its 20th year. Um and so in doing that, it historically had um, probably, yeah, a, a pretty crazy audience. You know, they would have speakers. And this was a long conference when we got it. It was, I think it was five to seven days long. No, seven days long. Insane for any conference. I mean, I know you go to a lot of conferences. And can you imagine <laughs> being at one? Seven in, in, days. In Laughlin, Nevada, Especially, no less. frankly. In Laughlin. Oh but I'm also horrible. thinking like. I've been to some conventions. I've been to some super, super nerd niche conferences as mm -hmm. well. And after about three days, like, I'm good. I need to go outside. I need to deal with people who are not talking shop all the time. Yeah. Like, I can't imagine a seven-day conference. Well, here's the thing. This conference was going on in Laughlin. And for two years, I think, before we got it, um, I'd been invited out to uh, kind of observe and also volunteer at the event when it was in Laughlin because... You know, we were working on this transition period for a mm -hmm. while. But so working on the, the AV crew, we'd go out, I think, a day before the conference and stay a day after for set up and tear down. So, you know, nine plus days living in a hotel in Laughlin, Nevada. It was pretty exhausting and took, I mean, you always have to recover after a conference. But that one was a good month-long recoup, primarily to get all of the old people and cigarettes out of my lungs. But it, it was kind <laughs> old of old people and cigarettes. Oh, people are just there waiting to die. It's so depressing. I hate Laughlin really? so much. Really? Oh, it's so sad. But I wouldn't. I couldn't. 
maybe, yeah, maybe I guess I could imagine a UFO conference would be older people. Yeah, primarily I it's would, older. And and here's huh. the thing that is fantastic and, you know, we were so, so happy about with what I and a colleague of mine were able to accomplish with that conference. Like I said, it was historically like pretty crazy stuff, pretty far out there, very much like preaching to the choir people, um, a lot of the really crazy stuff to come with UFOs. We were able to start slowly introducing more science into it. We would get mainstream scientists to come speak. We would get military officials to come speak. We would get people from former, former NASA people to come speak. It was incredible. So that was a huge accomplishment. It's something I was so proud of to get these scientists, get that scientific voice in there and get people thinking about it. And it, I think it surprised a lot of people and the press. I mean, it was great for press to hear the, these credible people coming to a UFO conference, um, yeah. you know, talking about stuff in a very rational, scientific way. And you bet your ass we got those angry grouchy people coming up to us saying what the hell is that guy here for we don't want his kind and you're well you know now your, your reaction the is exactly <laughs> your reaction is exactly why he's here you yeah. know and that's a frustrating mindset of dealing mm -hmm. with ufos or any field you know you have people who are very much in that religious mindset of you know this is what's established that's what's been told to me i've made up my mind don't tell me anything else i'm done thinking somebody else already told me what to think so huh. so i like trying to shake it up and and challenge people to think for themselves that's always a good idea yeah it's a hard it's a hard uh that's a hard pro to hoe as it were it's uh yeah t trying to get people to actually think as opposed to just believe the last thing they heard absolutely Absolutely. So, I mean, I definitely got yeah. thrown into the UFO world. Um, it's not something I expected, so but it's certainly an experience that I have loved so much. And, you know, it opened the doors for TV shows and various things, too. It created a lot of wonderful relationships. And, you know, I think I'm kind of stuck with it because I've done it for so long now. <laughs> and so I, I don't think yeah. UFOs are going anywhere anytime soon. And in fact, I just wrote a UFO book, so... Did I know that you wrote a book? I don't think I knew that. No, you didn't know that. I, I just announced it like last week or two weeks ago on, on my podcast, UFO Mod Pod. So yeah, that should be coming out in the next um, perhaps day or so. But Wait, who's, who published it? I published it. You, you self-published? I do everything myself. <laughs> Just start, it's, start a it's, concert it's venue, start a book. Technically, bands, technically publish book, the like. publisher listed on it is Rogue Planet, my my company. But okay, uh, right, yeah, right, right. yeah, totally self published. So, huh? I, I'm sorry, I'm writing this down. I need to. You need to text me a link to that when that's up. Oh, I, need to see I certainly will. Yeah, I got my good friend Caleb Hanks to do the artwork for it. It's fantastic. The title of the I... book is is called Only Weirdos See UFOs. Um, and it's kind Maybe of true. <laughs> it's kind of proving the opposite of that, you know, certainly right. acknowledging that crazy people, you know, certainly have their wonderful, fantastic stories. But right. it highlights sort of the history of the modern UFO era. It, it just provides a, a brief interview. It's not for UFO people. And that's what most UFO literature is. It's, you know, books written by UFO people for UFO people, yeah. you know, trying to preach to the choir and, you know, get their approval because they're saying what they know people want to hear yeah. um, this book is not not specifically for the ufo crowd it's for the general public it's to provide a general introduction um a brief overview of kind of the history of ufos and pointing out the types of cool. people who have seen ufos ranging from you know celebrities and military people and astronauts um it also kind of split in in multiple seg segments but um, extraterrestrial life's a big part of it too, talking about different thoughts on extraterrestrial life, including intelligent extraterrestrial life, um, some of the efforts underway to detect extraterrestrial life, um, and even claims by a former NASA astrobiologist that we've already discovered extraterrestrial life. So, you know, there's a whole lot of stuff in there. It's fascinating. It's all uh, documented and cited too, which I think is very important. But uh, absolutely, all yeah. done as a responsible and skeptical journalist. Wow, that's awesome. Congratulations. I can't believe I didn't know that you were doing that. <laughs> it was very hard for me to keep that secret. But uh, yeah, very, very few people were in the know. So. Why didn't you tell anybody about it? 
because if I decided that I wasn't going to do it. <laughs> exactly. That's no, I'm, I'm 100% with you on that. I always like, I only tell people about something I'm doing once I have a contract signed or yeah. I have an end date in mind. It's sort of like, I'm always wary of announcing things just in case like it doesn't work out for timing or whatever reason. But like, I have so like a hundred, cool. hundred projects that, you know, are, are half yeah. started or half completed. Um, Golly. so yeah, I, I don't bother talking yeah. about any of it until I actually know what's going to happen. Yeah, I totally get that, but that's super cool, and I am very excited to read that because I know, I know that you're you're the so I feel like this is a perfect segue into how I actually know you and why we ended up doing this podcast together, um, because I I met you through the UFO world yes. when you were uh, hosting, well, I mean not just hosting, you were writing, directing, editing, and producing spaced spacing out is the show right speaking yep, out, um, out. on open minds tv mm-hmm. and uh you asked me to come on as a guest via skype which was weird in retrospect because i was about four miles away from you when we were doing that skype call um to come in and talk about the curiosity landing and the first time i actually hosted the show with you and your former co-host maureen was out of town um met some of the people that you worked with and it was very interesting that in that office was i re- remember this the display case of cameras not of pictures of UFOs, but cameras that people had photographed UFOs. With. Wasn't that amazing? The, Didn't that completely change your mind? <laughs> it was one of those things where I was like, I'm not totally sure how I'm supposed to react to this because, um, yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't believe that there are UFOs signaling to us, but I believe that there is extraterrestrial life somewhere in the universe. It's got to be like just odd say that it should be a thing. But that was when I was like, right, you're the skeptic and the scientist, therefore, like. I'm okay to be friends with you. You know, this is just a side note. We should, for this show sometime, go out in LA to one of those UFO summonings. Oh my God. That would be amazing. Yes. yes. I saw a summoning in, uh, was it an Echo Park somewhere? There's Probably. like, on there's okay, I don't remember what park it is, but like there's a park and you can look over Dodger Stadium and all the fancy things. And there was a guy doing a summoning. And I looked him up online. I forget his name. You probably know who this is, but I looked. There this are a few guy of up. them who do it regularly. Yeah. Um, so I, I looked at some of his videos of like how he does his summonings and um, pictures and video testimonials of like real things he spotted and every single one of them because I had been in the park that day and saw what other kinds of things were going on on a Sunday morning in Los Angeles. It was 100% escaped balloons from quinceanera celebrations. <laughs> it's just like, oh, of course you don't see things when it's not like. Mexican holiday like it was just so it was just so obvious to be in that park and be like oh my god this is just nuts what you need to do is get a drone to either be be a UFO but also like whatever they they see as a UFO like film it from up there and see what it really is yeah you know and that's the great thing about having like you know good cameras on those scenes where you can actually like zoom in and and see things better because there's a lot of weird shit in the sky. Like stuff looks weird. Oh, for sure. Um, and that's, you know, the majority of UFO sightings. I mean, there's no secret about that. And most responsible journalists, UFO researchers will, will tell you that 95% of all UFOs can be explained. I mean, there is weird shit. And that's why, why Chinese lanterns and even the International Space Station, you know, are reported so many times. Because yeah. if you're not used to seeing them, they look weird as shit. Like yeah. there's so much stuff. And certain atmospheric conditions and things make... Just normal things look weird in the sky. Yeah. yeah. So it's easy to get confused if you're not used to seeing things. But, you know, these people who yeah. summon UFOs are just really shameful people. I mean, they, they know exactly what they're doing, but they do it regularly mm-hmm. and they post on social media and get these groups to come out. And yep. you know, it's just so frustrating. I would, I would love to go to one of those and just not mention the word science and just see what it's like. So we, we should we should do it just to... You know, get some yeah. footage and throw it up, and then we can talk about it later. But it'd be, you know, it'd be very interesting. An example of having great technology. Um, I was on an episode of a, a short-lived show on Nat Geo called "Chasing UFOs," and all those people are my friends. I love them. Um, but Ben McGee was the the science oh, yeah. on the show. This he he brought the science. There was they had it broken into three. They had uh, science believer and skeptic his role was science and they gave him for this particular episode we did a gigantic 
lens on this camera and i forget the specs on it but it was really rad and really expensive yeah um so we were out in the middle of the desert at night and we were with this guy who sees ufos over phoenix all the time and we see this light go up in the sky conveniently um <laughs> and <laughs> not implying anything but there just happened to be a light when we were out there so um you know it looked pretty awesome looked pretty pretty weird and even with the cameras, you know, I had with me and uh, a really big lens and, and stuff we had too, but even zooming in with that stuff, um, couldn't really determine much, you know, and also with optics at night when you zoom in, like, yeah, it looks like this thing's changing shape and it looks like there might be, you know, an alien inside or, you know, different weird things um, you're seeing on the camera. But with this amazing lens that Ben McGee had, uh, he was using, he pointed it right at it, zoomed in, and you could clearly see the very defined shape of a Chinese lantern. Huh. It was amazing seeing that detail. Later That's that awesome. night, we saw tons of other lights in the distance that were very weird, but they were flares being dropped by planes um, out of Luke Air Force Base. And huh. it was awesome that they chose that night to drop flares because, you know, those are other things that look really weird in the sky. These right. things looked awesome and they were dropping a shit ton of them. I have no idea why. You know, I grew up in Phoenix and I've seen flares all the time. I mean, yeah. I had great view of the Barry, Barry Goldwater range and saw flares dropped all the time by the A-10s. But these were just dropping nonstop. It was crazy and it was a great show to watch. But with this awesome. lens, he could zoom in and basically see the outline of the pilots themselves in the jets coming in for a landing when oh they were god, done. Oh my god, that's nuts. It was amazing. And of course they didn't use any of that footage on the show, but right. it was epic. I, I want that lens. <laughs> Oof, I can't, if it can resolve that kind of detail, I can't even imagine how expensive that would be, but that's so cool. Well, it was that's several hundred thousand fun. dollars for sure. Ugh. Yeah. Dolly. Oh. <laughs> um, that's what I find so interesting. And like for me, the UFO stuff is like, I enjoy it because it's a thing that is unexplained until you dig into the science and then can science the shit out of it. And then it becomes really fun. Yeah, I agree. It's like a fun, teachable moment of like, you see this, this is what you think. Well, here's why you think that. And here's what's really happening. Yeah. Yeah. I guess we go from you and I meeting because I don't know how you found me covering the Curiosity Landing, actually. So, but you did. Yeah. No, I, I think it's, yeah, it's fun. Um, you know, <laughs> I. The weekly space hangouts, was it that whole, like. It, it, it was certainly that, that's a part of it. You know, at the yeah. time, you know, like I, like I mentioned, um, you know, I was following anything space related um every single day and and being a journalist plowing through the news um at the time you know just regular journalists writing about space and things going on with current space events um you were one of the journalists that uh, you know i would regularly cite to and post links to articles and things like that awesome. so yeah. <laughs> yeah i mean at right. the t at the time um i'm trying to remember there were just a a couple of people that i found myself um, you know, reading pretty regularly and, and citing to, and it was you and I think Jason Major. Um, I don't remember who else, but yeah. So that's how I how I found you. I mean, you were nice. you were one of the people that uh, I was certainly following for for Space News. Cool, which is so funny because that was like I was a year and a half into my career at that yep. point, which is, um. So yeah, back at one point in my life, I was like an actual space journalist. Um. But let's go further back than that because my space story starts way long ago when I was a tender age of seven wearing red corduroy pants in a second grade school project presentation. Uh, true story because I have the picture of me gesturing to my poster. I thought you were um, going to say I still have the <laughs> pants and I'm sure you could fit in them. But. Uh, I don't think I don't think I wasn't that big as a seven year old. Um, I do weirdly. This is like the weirdest thing. But I, um, I still have my kilt from high school because I went to a private school and I've had that kilt since the seventh grade. And I've moved the buttons over as I grew up, but I wore it to my cousin's wife's bachelorette party because we all had to dress up as the Shauna that we know. And she and I went to the same high school. That's how I knew her before she and my cousins started That's dating. Fun. So I, I dressed up as high school Shauna and like wore my uniform. And it was like, wow, I actually still fit into this thing 15 <laughs> years later. Nice. Um, 
But no, I don't have those pants. Um, I was seven, and I can't remember. My mom and I remember the story differently, but at any rate, I ended up doing a second grade project on Venus, which I thought was the coolest thing out of this world, because not in the world, um, that it was like roughly the same size as the Earth, not that much closer to the sun than the Earth, um, and yet it rotates backwards compared to all the other planets. Uh, its year, its day is one year long, and also it's like the Earth turned inside out and on fire and full of death, but it's right there in the sky and you can see it. And even, you know, when you're, I was seven and you can pick it out, it's very easy to find Venus in the night sky. And I was like, it's so cool that I can see this planet. And I know that like, if I were to go to there, it would be like a raging inferno and death. Um, so that just like got me really interested in the variety of planets in our solar system. And then I got one of those like little kids for space books. It was actually called, I think a thousand and one facts about space. I got it like the book fair at my school that year and every planet has a two-page spread and the one on the moon has a little cartoon of two astronauts walking on the surface in front of a lunar module and because I grew up in Canada where not everybody and their grandfather works for NASA or a NASA contractor I had never heard of the moon landings and I just had that moment of wait they went to the moon and I was not informed and I just like wanted to know like how and why this happened. Like yeah. what, like it's, it. I couldn't get my tiny seven year old brain around like, why would you do that? Cause like I knew the moon was pretty, but I couldn't imagine like walking on it. Um, so then I just became like fascinated with Apollo and it, it worked out that like three years later, Apollo 13 came out and I was a little bit older and could kind of understand it. And I was already a huge Tom Hanks fan because big is a great movie. Um, and that was just like, oh, my God. And there are real people that went into space, of course. And I started, like, reading about the astronauts. And, like, that's how I kind of got fascinated with, like, understanding and tracking Apollo. So I was just, like, that weird nerd that loved it, but I wasn't good at math. So ended up, like, the long story short is I ended up, like, studying history of science and then and then uh, corporate communications and public relations because that is a soul-sucking experience uh, that we can talk about another time. And then I did a master's in science technology studies, which is, like, soul-sucking in the other direction because the only thing worse than, like, constantly being in school is constantly being in school to impress a bunch of old professors. Um, I just didn't want to stay in academia. So I just left. I didn't even go to my, my graduation for my master's. I have the diploma, but like they mailed it to me cause I didn't want to go. It was two <laughs> hours. I was living at home for that year too. And it was a two hour commute each way. Oh. I was like, Oh, forget fuck that. I'm not doing that. Um, graduations so I, are boring anyway. They're so boring. My high school graduation was fine because there was 57 people and my undergrad oh, nice. graduation was fine because there was like a, there were two people in my in my year in my uh, degree field. Wow. So like you knew everybody. So when it's like small in a community, it's sort of like I want to go because I want to support my friends. Sure. That one I was just like, I really don't give a shit. Um, yeah. My parents were a little bit mad, but meh. Um, yeah. So yeah, I just like I ended up moving to Phoenix uh, and starting a blog. And that was just like my weird thing of like, I don't know what to do with my life right now. Um, but I know that I love this. So I started blogging and then the blogging like within two months, like I started my blog in November and in January I was writing for other websites. Like it just happened really, really quickly. And I yeah. don't even know how, um, it was supposed yeah, to like, happen. Apparently it was because like I've always loved writing. I've always loved reading, but it was just like, I had to find that midpoint between like like popular writing and science writing to find like the popular science writing. Um, and it just like, it worked out really, really quickly. They started writing for different websites and gradually like started getting paid for it, uh, which was awesome. So that was like, you met me around that time when it was like the science journalism, but my blog was always this like super weird niche of space history. So I was like doing these two things simultaneously. Um, but it was really like, I started it just to engage my nerddom of Apollo and it was just 100% for me to just like, I want to have a reason to dig into these old mission reports. That's and then awesome. just like spiraled. It just spiraled into like whatever it is you would call my job right now. Like I had a meeting with a bunch of uh, YouTube YouTube people for a thing that I'm not allowed to talk about because I'm under like a bunch of NDAs right now. <laughs> um, but yeah, they like came to my house to see my studio space, which is also just my apartment. Um, and they were like, so what do you like, what do you call your job? I'm like, don't know it's really weird to define what i do now but like it's space history it's just space history all the way down yeah it's odd I'll have to come up with a 
a very cool title for you. <laughs> I mean, spa- space content creator is yeah. a little dry, but it's, I, it's I usually more accurate, go with but... I go with space space flight historian right. because that's like ultimately everything I do right now. It's very rare at this point that I do like straight up journalism, which I actually don't mind because yeah. I don't know if you've ever done like working within the news cycle, but it's rough. It and is. like, I, I get that some people thrive on that energy and that sort of need to get something done immediately. But like, it honestly just pisses me off because it breeds so much sloppy writing and oh, bad research. Absolutely. It's just like what I always wanted, wanted to do is like a, a weekly science roundup of like last week in science. Like, let's take a few days, let's see what the discussion is online, and then let's answer the questions that people have that no one can answer an hour after the press release comes out. It's like, it's super, because like when I covered Curiosity's Landing, that was the first time I was at JPL that night. And I was in the media room, and it was the first time I ever saw like regular journalists like doing their thing. And everybody spent the entire day writing their stories on the successful landing and the failed landing. And they just left blank spaces where they would fill in the details. And I was like, this, this is soul sucking. This is taking something so cool, so cool and making it so horrible. And I was so happy that my role that day was just to do a live webcast. Yeah. And everybody was fighting to like get their stories into their editors and be like, I'm just going to text him the the time so that he can push it live immediately because everyone's just trying to get the first story to get all the views to make all the money. And I was like, this is the worst. So, yeah, I just like I I can't do the journalism thing, but like writing is awesome. <laughs> so, yeah, that's my space story. The yeah. ranty version of the space story, no, but I am like story. almost done the beer now, so. Uh oh, <laughs> gotta gotta hurry that story now. No, I'm I'm with you on that. I mean, journalism is so depressing, and having written for you know a few different media outlets, it's just, it's not surprising at all. I mean, it would be surprising if stories actually had, you know, real details and things yeah. that were fact checked and cited to. Um, but yeah, the the amount of stories that they make people turn out every day um, as quickly as they do um, for as little money as they do, it's no wonder it's all crap. Yeah. It, it really mean, is. I love like when you get into like the deep dive journalism stuff, like I love the research that's involved and yeah. like following stories. And like when you're a journalist as opposed to anyone in like law enforcement or something, like you have more ability to like talk to different people and follow different paths and be speculative and like try to make connections. Like that part is really feeling like, the research element. But like for me, that comes from the academic side of things. It's not a thing that I see specifically in journalism. So it's just like, sure. Yeah, that's that's the kind of journalism that I like, but that's not what most people do. And yeah, the money that people give you for doing journalism is not, especially online. I don't know if like print media is different, but print media exists. Yeah, it does exist. Oh my god! So when I was working with New Horizons last summer, um, I was right embedded. I was an embedded journalist, so I was on the team that was like creating the press releases and the media that we'd push out about the mission, um, which meant like conversations every day with like the PI and all the team leads and all the science people about what they want to get out, what's most important. Then we'd like break it into English for the humans and then like package it nicely and put it out. And everybody in that room, I I mean, I will say I was the youngest person by 30 years and the only woman on that mm, team. So wow. let me tell you how interesting that was to be taken seriously. Yeah. Um, but it was everybody, you know, they wanted to be, front page above the fold on the New York Times. They wanted the print media. And I'm like, guys, what you want is to go viral on Twitter. Like if, and I, like we had this fight. I was like, if you want your image to go crazy and have more people talking about your stuff, you have the best stuff to work with. Make your image caption tweet length. And then everybody will know what you're talking about and it'll just get shared all over the place. Yeah. And when they finally listened to me, like, yeah, they had stuff get picked up all over the place, but it was just so... It was so interesting working in like the mix of science with research and journalism with old media and new media in one on one at one table <laughs> every day for four hours for a month. It was it was bizarre. Yeah, yeah. I bet it, it was, was very, very interesting. And the conversations were hilarious. And I mean, yeah, those are other stories. But like, it was just so it's just so interesting to see how different people still view media. Yeah. And even like my parents still like, 
you know, I'll tell them like, oh, I just signed some contract to host some show. They're like, oh, cool. I'm like, yeah, it's going to be uh, it's new media. So it's on YouTube. They're like, oh, <laughs> it's like it's hard. It's hard to gauge that like that's still a thing. Sure. Yeah. New media is not completely distinct from old media. It's just it's all media. They all make money the same way. But it's yeah, it's very different. But yeah, it's a weird, complicated world we live in. It is. <sighs> It is, which is why I like just sitting at, quietly at my desk with my my cat sitting on my arms all the time while I just write my nerdy things about space history. Yeah, I don't know why I'm thinking about this now, but <laughs> your um, comment about your your kilt. Um, I don't know if you saw this, but so I'm a big astrobiology enthusiast. That's something that I'm very much into, um, and I even got a astrobiology certificate uh, from one of those Coursera courses. I think when Coursera first launched, one of the first courses they had was an astrobiology course. So yeah. I took that and the professor who did that course was uh, Professor Charles Cockell from uh, the UK. And I just read, I think yesterday, or the day before, um, I think Astrobiology Magazine posted it. Um, but Professor Cockell like submitted or licensed or whatever you do a tartan for astrobiology <laughs> really so astrobiology so you can has like its own literally tartan. join the clan yes exactly <laughs> so one of these days i'll get a, get uh, my official astrobiology kilt that's that'll be good <laughs> that'll be weird i don't think i've ever seen a man in a kilt in phoenix Mm, have you seen? I can't think of the last time I saw a man in a kilt. Have you seen No Effects here? No, the last time the last time I saw No Effects was with you in uh, San Diego, okay. and I couldn't see I couldn't see No Effects. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't <laughs> uh, either. That, to be fair, by so. that point all the bros were directly in front of me, and I was just looking at a bunch of necks. Um, yeah. When did No Effects become the bro punk band? Like, that's a thing because I've seen No a Effects a few ago. times in recent years, but like I kind of forgot. That like that was the thing that was except that was the one punk band that for some reason the bros latched onto. And every time I've been to a festival that No Effects is playing, it's like you know No Effects is coming on because people have magically done the research of set lists because they only want to see No Effects. And then all of a sudden, all these guys in tank tops and backwards hats just like come out of nowhere. Like, where did you all come from? Well, sadly, Why are you here? It's sadly, very weird. Isn't, isn't that true for all of the bands we love from the '90s? I guess. I guess. Yeah, uh, maybe, maybe I mean, not all. R- Real Big Fish is a pretty big bro band. But... Yeah, I guess, I guess that's true. I don't know. I, yeah, I guess that's true. Although I've been to more of their shows recently where the audience is like surprisingly young. Like they're 18. Well, that's because you're on the stage and you only see the people up front. That's a different <laughs> that, crowd. That is, that is true. I do. But even, yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's just because I've been to events with them recently that's like, that are to skew younger? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I've, they're, I've they're, they're more... still at least a band who tours constantly. Yeah, constantly. So, you know, they're oh they're doing that and, and in doing and so, do... getting new fans. So And they do weird shows. Like, yeah. I saw them at, at the, the Beach Goth Festival in Santa mm. Ana a few weeks ago. And there was, like, actually, I was laughing pretty hard that there was a line of kids towards the front that were, like, they just epitomized a beach goth. Like, they were in shorts and tank tops with, like, the full-on emo hair but, like, white face paint to be, like, like super goth kid but also punk goth. Like, it was just, like, and they were maybe That's 15. Amusing. Like, they were so young. I was like, what? How, like, who are these people? It was really funny. Uh Again, to each their own. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's true. I guess there's a lot of bands that have been sort of like reappropriated from the '90s into like pop culture bands. I don't know. Yep, it's absolutely. odd. It's a little bit odd. That's why I, I go to shows and I, I, I we're coming full circle on this one. I go to shows, I immediately grab a beer, so I just like stop paying attention to things around me and just enjoy it. Yeah, I'm with you there. Yeah, it's because yeah. I'm old. <laughs> yeah, I. Ugh. You know, I'm we're gonna talk one. about. All of this stuff so much because, again, that's what this podcast is. We'll go in-depth um, 
these all these topics. But the one topic we need to kind of brief over um, on this episode is our last one, and that would be animals, pets, fur babies, <laughs> and. I will yeah. let you go first because um, you are the proud mother of a celebrity. So I am weirdly the proud cat mama to a famous cat. Um, Pete Conrad, my cat, who is named after the commander of Apollo 12. So he's got some space nerd in him. And um, he is famous because people on the Internet know him because he's in the background of my videos. And it's very odd. But um, my favorite was when I was actually trying to get verified on Twitter for absolutely no reason beyond I'm annoyed that they wouldn't verify me. Um I found that I have an IMDb page. I did not make it. I do not care about these things. But the page has my name. And then the trivia is her cat's name is Pete Conrad after the... I'm just like, seriously, Pete has higher billing than any of my actual credits on IMDb. So Pete is famous. It's kind of amazing. Um, it's, uh, it's really, really funny. Um, Pete. Yeah, Pete is a massive, great, happy cat. He is 18 pound, or 13 pounds, but not overweight. He's just huge. Um, and he's handsome and he's lovely. I've had Pete since he was five weeks old. Aww. So he grew up like he um, actually got him in Phoenix at the uh, an animal hospital near where my ex and I were living. And he was raised by vets since he was like four days old. And then I took him home early. He was a pound and a half. Aww. He like fit in the pot. Like I have tiny hands and he fit in the palm of my hand. So he's so social. And because I work from home, he's so good about being around people, which is really, really fun. And yeah. I was never a cat person growing up, mm. which is the weirdest part about me being owned by a cat right now. Um, I always wanted a dog. And my mom, I was a competitive gymnast and went to school really far from, I went to a snooty French private school. So like if, if Toronto is a rectangle, we live here. My school was here. My gym club was here. So yeah, there was no time for me to also walk a dog. Yeah. So my parents ended up, my parents got a dog three weeks after I moved out. For university they literally replaced me with something equally small and white they have a west highland uh, white terrier <laughs> he's adorable and i love the dog but it's really yeah. funny that i was 100 I, I call them sometime and i'm like hi it's your first born as opposed to your first bot that's right um but yeah so i always i've always been a dog person but when i moved in with my ex oh golly so many years six years ago in phoenix um he had a cat i didn't really know what to do with cats because yeah. like they just kind of are awful. <laughs> um, and then I ended up, it took me a year to like understand how cats work. And also for yeah. this cat who was rescued off the street to like trust me and love me. So Emma, I fell in love with this cat. And then my ex decided that like we needed a kitten because experiencing <laughs> kittens are way more fun than cats. So he bought me a cat for my, my 27th birthday, which ultimately ended up me going and picking the cat and then paying for all of his vaccination. So I bought myself a cat for my birthday. Um, but that was Pete. And then so Pete grew up like my favorite thing about him is that he doesn't even know how to cat. Right. Like <laughs> because we had this older cat, Emma, that hated this tiny kitten. So Aww. Pete would try to play and Emma would be like, you little dick, I hate you and hiss. And he thought hissing means I'm having so much fun. So mm. whenever Pete's like agitated and like playing and getting really excited and he starts hissing, I have to tell people like, oh, no, no he's not being aggressive. He's just really excited. He just doesn't know how to cat. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, he's like. He's a weird cat. He likes to go for walks in the hall on his leash. He likes the car. That's awesome. And so weird. He, he's like literally like sits at my desk like in my face all the time because he just wants to know. He's like, you're here. You're here. Hi, I'm here. Can I do stuff? Do stuff. Do stuff with me. He just <laughs> stares, stares at him. He's like, may, may, may I help you? Thank you. <laughs> so it's fun. Yeah, I'm 100% owned by a cat. It's bad. But anyways. So but so, I started so for out you. kind of the. Oh, by dog the opposite because I grew up with cats. So I always thought I was a cat person. Hmm. And then when I met my wife, she was a dog person and not a cat person. And I didn't have cats at that time. So, you know, I got to know her dogs and, you know, made it very clear that it wasn't really a dog person. Because to me, you know, I, I grew up with dogs too. And, and the dogs were always just kind of these big slobbery kind of annoying things the dogs that she had were these small dogs that seemed to act more like cats than dogs i was mm. all hmm okay 
if, if these dogs can be like cats, I, I can get on board with this. And so we eventually got two of our own and, uh, you know, they're little seven pound guys, little Maltese, these white, white fluffy dogs who are 15 years old now with all of their poor health problems. But they're totally our kids. They're these little sweet things that are like cats. They like curling up with us and taking up too much of the bed at night, even though they're like this big. But, but uh, yeah, they're, they're definitely our, our babies. Um, Hercules and Odysseus, those seem to be the appropriate names for <laughs> tiny oh, macho those dogs. Those are very so. good names. So. Yeah. But, yeah, love those little guys, and, uh, man, I hope the DEA never raids our house because we have so many drugs. Like, the dresser is just lined with all of these drugs they take. For, and the funny thing dogs? is, one one of the medications that Hercules has to take um, for either his heart or his kidneys um, is a controlled substance. So, you know, it's a little more difficult to get. I can't just get it through the mail or whatever. I've got to go in person and, and show my ID when I get it. It's crazy. That's that's intense for dog medication. Is it also human medication? Like what? Oh yeah, yeah. No, it's an it's a abused I mean, I, substance. I, yeah, but, uh... I know. I know these things can go hand in hand because I got a prescription for, I think it was Ativan from my doctor mm-hmm. for Pete mm-hmm. when I had to take him on a plane when I when I moved out to L.A. Uh, it was the first and only time he's ever flown, and I I had to drug him because he yeah. was just. There's way too much going on that day. Yeah, it was funny. Yeah, yeah no, we get um, almost all of his prescriptions from a people pharmacy. You know, we just get it at Walgreens. Yeah. Um, one is only a pet medication, so we have to get that at the vet. But yeah, right. all the others are, are people, people vet. People, people, people vet, a.k.a. doctor. Yep. Yeah, interesting, yeah. I mean, I, it makes sense. My my parents' dog, the replacement child, if you will, is again. Oh golly, when did I graduate high school? It's been like f- thirteen years, yeah, something don't, around don't, there. Don't count the years. It's depressing. Oh, many but. years. I know. It's uh, meh. But yeah. The, anyways, the dog is old. Is the point? And um, he's starting to lose his eyesight, and he's starting to get arthritis, and he's diabetic, and all these like. I mean, this is the problem with purebred dogs. Is like yeah. they have from inbreeding, they have so many more problems. Whereas mutts are just like hearty little things that will eventually fall over and die because everything dies. Sorry to ruin things, kids, but everything dies. Um, but yeah, so this this dog has like similar medications to human things and like some of it is like, oh yeah, I can just get this at the drugstore. Like that's super weird that you can just like buy your pet meds at your drugstore where you pick up your own medication. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. Thank, thankfully, Pete is uh, Pete's turning four in February, so he's he's not in need of meds yet. Well, that's good. Pete should stay healthy. Uh, I keep every time every time my parents tell me what's going on with the dog, I'm just like Pete, Pete, never get old. Yep. Never get don't old. Do that, I Pete. don't. Yeah, you're not allowed to die. Pete's not allowed to die. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we we love ours so much, and uh, it's actually kind of my insane love for them that started me down the road of, of, uh, becoming vegan. So really I'm, I'm vegan now. It was, I mean, I won't lie. It was immediately my wife. Like I'm a ridiculous weirdo. And the first date we went on, um, so many years ago, I guess 17 years ago, um, was, I took her to this, and she was nice. She didn't say anything, and she should have. But I took her to this uh, chicken place next to, uh, or in the in the neighborhood of of Arizona State University, and she didn't want anything. And you know, I'm too dumb to pick up on things. And then I'm sitting there eating in front of her, feeling bad. And I'm all, "Will you please eat some of this? I feel really bad." And she's all, "No, no, no." She's being very polite. And then she eventually told me she was vegetarian at the time, and. I felt terrible and for forcing her to go there and watch me eat this chicken. <laughs> so I got up and took my food, threw it in the trash, and I said, all right, let's go. And from that moment, I became vegetarian. So Wow. That, that After was, a first date, too. That was my quick change. Wow. And, uh, yeah, then, then my introduction and uh, growing love for, for my animals uh, started me on the road for, for the vegan thing, but that really, huh. you know, she was again, my, my ultimate change because, um, she made the switch to, to vegan 
and I'm the cook in the family, so mm -hmm. you know I'm certainly not going to make two meals. So it's just easier for me yeah. to figure out how to make everything I wanted to eat, but make it vegan. So right. And you know, you mentioned when we were talking about uh, Colorado, it was funny because I went to Denver Comic Con a couple of years ago, and <laughs> it was just a funny thing because being vegan, looking around, it's a great, great city for vegans, but uh, it was hard to distinguish what places were dispensaries and what places were <laughs> vegan, vegetarian restaurants because everything's called yeah. green something or other, you know? Right, or, you... right. Pretty funny. I, I could see that, especially in Colorado. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've got some really good friends who are vegan and I find it very commendable. And I'm, I'm vegetarian, but I'm not fussy. For me, it's texture. Mm. The idea, I just can't chew meat that will like bounce back in my mouth. It mm. freaks me out. Um, but it always, for me, comes down to cheese. Yeah. I've had vegan cheese. My very dear friend Eddie is vegan. And every time I hang out with him and like his work people who I also know and love, it's always, they're all vegan. And to the point of like, actually we found all they know of and I found. Um, one of the best donut shops I've ever tried is in Vegas off the strip and it's vegan. Hmm. Um, I don't know if you've ever been there because I know you enjoy Vegas, but I think it's Rand, Rand, it's not Randy's. There's an R, though. It might be Randy's. Alps? Is it Randy's? I can't remember. I know Randy's what? is the one in L.A. that's like the iconic guy holding the donut. Because I've also had a Randy's donut, and it was not nearly as satisfying as mm. it should have been considering how iconic that donut man is. Yeah. But, um, yeah, hanging out with vegans is like there's a lot of really good vegan food. We found really great vegan pizza. Again, amazing in downtown Vegas. But um, it always comes down to just missing cheese. Well, you're in the right city cheese. for it. There, I, I miss yeah. the, the restaurants in L.A. So many great restaurants. Um, Mohawk Bend is one of my favorites. They always have great vegan stuff. I have heard of that place so many times, but I've never been. Their cocktails are amazing. Got to go there. Mm. But, uh, yeah, they, they do good vegan stuff. Um, but yeah, so many great restaurants there. Vegas is great for vegans too. And yeah, I don't really venture off the strip when I'm in Vegas. So really? I don't, I would see, I would see you as I, I tend towards downtown always like Fremont street is just so weird and so it, fun. And it like, it is weird, but no, I'm, yeah. I'm, 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 I stay on the strip and I, I pretty huh. much walk the entire strip, Yeah. but, uh, now very one time. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say the one time I went to Vegas and stayed on the strip, that's also, that's what I did was just like go for a walk, just wander down the strip and just like duck into some like, oh, this, this, I've heard of this casino. I should just go like poke my head in and obviously have a drink because that's all you can do in Vegas. And like, yep. I don't gamble. Yep. Um, but it was just such a weird experience. And like, I was there alone the first time I went to Vegas, which yeah. is a very odd thing, but like it made sense. And uh, I was just like neat to explore Vegas and just wander up and down the strip and just like have everything you need at your fingertips all everywhere. It's so yeah. weird. Like nothing on the strip in Vegas. It's so funny because it's like I always describe Vegas as like if you took an alien like like a, like a Martian and said, here's everything that's good, that's bad, that's wrong, that's right, that's excessive, that's poor in America. And uh, now design me America, but you only have five miles to work with. They would give you Las Vegas. Like they would give you the strip. Like nothing that exists there should exist. <laughs> it is weird as shit. And I love it so, so much. Weird. So it's so weird. Yeah, I, so, I yeah, try, I try to be there Vegas. like every other month if I can. But uh, <laughs> no, it's it's amazing. We'll have to do yeah. it sometime together. Um, yeah. But yeah, again, yeah, it's great for vegan food. And I try to stay near the south end of the strip because in the, uh, I think they call it the Mandalay shops or the shops at Mandalay Bay. Um, mm -hmm. Technically, it's in this kind of area between Mandalay Bay and Luxor. Right. Um, there are two restaurants there owned by the, the same person. Um, one is called Slice of Vegas. It's a pizza place predominantly. And the other is called Hasong's. And despite sounding Asian, it's Mexican food. Um, huh. But I would have guessed Indian. They both have separate vegan menus. Huh. And their food is fantastic. So at Slice of Vegas, okay. you can get pizzas, sandwiches, whatever. They have, you know, all the their fake meat. So you can get like a, a meatball pizza. Um, they've got the fake cheese and, and all that. So really good stuff there. The, the Mexican place is really good too. So those are kind of our, our go-tos, but, uh, down at the opposite end of the strip, all the way at the North, uh, the wind properties, every single one of those mm -hmm. restaurants have vegan menus too. Really? Cause Steve Wynn is a, he's a fake vegan, but, um, fake he, vegan, fake vegan. He cheats sometimes, but <laughs> that's a secret. 
I'm, I'm I heard, a I heard vegan, from his but I, I really love bacon. Well, it's it's almost that. Yeah, I, I heard from one of his chefs. They kind of spilled the beans, but uh, huh. no, he he publicly is is a vegan and and has made sure that all of his restaurants have vegan menus. So right. So and they I they mean, got good food. It's really really fancy too. So it's really expensive. But sometimes I spoil myself and go down there. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's not surprising that Vegas caters to every possible walk of life, and especially on the Strip where it's like catering to predominantly people who are willing to spend a lot of money and would then draw in celebrities i imagine who are more into being vegan for i feel like just popularity reasons as opposed to moral or dietary reasons sure it's like it's cool to be vegan now suddenly oh it's cool to only drink coconut water suddenly and you know the fad diet thing but yeah it's like it's not surprising that that vegas would cater to all diets but well and it's yeah, in their I, name too yeah. i mean what is somebody called who's from las vegas las vegan is that oh. really i didn't know yeah. that yeah it's pretty funny oh las vegan i did not know that interesting okay yeah huh. yep love that city i'm actually going there for christmas so Oh, yeah. You did mention that to me once. That's I love that that's a YouTube for Christmas. Oh, I totally do Vegas um, for Christmas, yeah. One of these years, I'm going to do a weird family holiday alone in Vegas just to see what it's like. <laughs> you need to. You It'll need be to. weird. It'll be a lot of sitting around, looking around, and just people watching and wishing I could be invisible so no one would talk to me. Yeah. 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 It's fine. You can that's... do it. You can do it. No, we, we definitely have to do Vegas sometimes. It's... Yeah. Yeah, fun. Vegas is Vegas is all kinds of weird, but I like it. I and like it. it has the National Atomic Testing Museum. I know. <laughs> fun, weird place. I, I've got to be the only person who goes to Vegas for a vacation just to like spa, lie around by a pool and just drink. But then also walk three miles to the Atomic Testing Museum. Because you walk too? I walked, yeah. Good for I you. Did. That's what I do too. And I, I always, yeah, I always uh, underestimate how far it is. I'm all, I've done this before. It's not, not a big deal. It wasn't that far. I hate, like, I, I was staying at the Trump, which I will never go back to because Trump. Um, but I will say that it was a beautiful hotel. It was hot wire, so it was dirt cheap. Um, nice. But yeah, it was only like two and a half miles. I'm like, eh, it's not that far. It was really far, <laughs> but it was fine. It yeah. was just hot. But yeah, no, it was it was cool to like go see stuff that's off the strip. And I like finding, I like going to cities and finding the weird stuff that only locals usually know about yeah. and things that are sort of like not the immediate facade of a city that are sort of like one layer back. Um, like, have you been to, I was told before I went to Vegas the first time to go to the Double Down Saloon? No, I actually haven't. I feel like you'd love it. It's like yeah. it's like a dive bar that is, you know, plays up the dive bar nest with like graffiti everywhere. Yeah. But it's also just like obviously a bar where no tourists go. It's like it's only a block off the strip. Like yeah. it's not that far. Um, but it's just all of a sudden you're in this like tiny dingy room and like everybody that goes there is a local who just yeah. lives there. And it's like it's such a different vibe. It's just I don't know. It's kind of neat to just yeah, go they, and see. They have like, a, a little brewery that's off the strip now. There are a couple of breweries there, but there's one that's walkable from the strip, huh. and I forget what property it's in. It's changed ownership a couple of times recently, but it's total kind of local, weird, very very weird in there, but fun. And yeah. I forget they have a promo if you sign up for their player's card like most places do and get a free tour of their brewery. Interesting thing. So you just sign fun. up for a player's card to get a free tour of a brewery because yeah. most breweries do that for free, anticipating yeah. that you will buy at least a beer. Well, and most <laughs> of these places are really small. And when you're sitting yeah. there, you see their brewery. So their tour would be, yeah. see that? That's the Looks brewery. Looks through this window. Here's the That's brewery. That's the brewery. Okay. That's your tour. Money, please. Tips. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Yeah, but I, I do the same thing. And that's a great thing about Vegas for me is it's walkable and I love yeah. walking and exploring. So yeah, it's, it's definitely neat. And it's one of those places that's like, I mean, granted, it's definitely different for a woman traveling alone than sure. a man or especially a man with his wife traveling somewhere. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's like you sit down anywhere and people will come talk to you. And so, you know, for the most part, they're weirdos, but Every once in a while, there's like a normal human being who's just super cool. And it's just like, hey, I'm just like, yeah, cool. New friend. Well, you never know. You never know when you're going to meet interesting people. And That's yeah. right. Yeah. Like the last time my wife and I were in Vegas and we were propositioned by a porn star who wanted us to come and party. But <laughs> Okay. You know, I've not had that experience. That's, although... that's why I love Vegas. It's just so fun and weird. It's it's its own world. It is, it is super weird. I always felt I thought the the strangest like 
five minutes was when I was walking up the strip. And I think my cousin, my cousin um, goes to Vegas a lot for trade shows, which I, I always think it's weird that Vegas is where trade shows are. Like he's in the fixture it's, display business. Like he literally sells coat hangers. It's built for con- conventions. That, it totally is. If I ever so do a convention, weird. which I probably will, because that's the yeah. way I operate. Um, yeah. I'll do it in Vegas because it is just built for Have everything conventions. that you need. Everything in is space. there. It's the airport's great. It's easy to get to. People can choose from a variety of hotels, mostly yeah. cheap it hotels, is all and you can walk. Yeah, and their transportation is easy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I do get it, but it still it always seems weird because when you think Vegas, you don't think trade conventions but um right yeah let's go do let's go do do our serious business let's go do business let's actually try to like land new accounts in vegas um but that's also why i would do it there too because people can bring their spouses their significant others or if they don't want to go for the whole thing there's built-in entertainment you don't have to like come up with all these separate like off-site events or whatever to give people things to do like they're fine on their own I've been to conferences where it's like, uh, this is fun, but I'm in the middle of nowhere, like not prairies, prairies or Canada. What's the equivalent of prairie provinces in America? I don't know. Bible Belt America. <laughs> like, you know, wherever it is in America yeah. where you're like, I'm not in a major city, therefore yeah. there's nothing to do here. And I've been to places like that where it's like, this is awesome. I would love to leave this conference for dinner right now and just like experience the rest of the world for a night before I jump back in tomorrow. And you can't do that because you're in the middle of nowhere in a small town. So yeah, I do I do get that Vegas kind of has something for everybody so that you can get your work done but also have a regular life. But yeah. Um, yeah, no, I was just going to say that I went from this, like, he always stays at the win. Um, so I went to just go, like, wander around and have a drink because that's all I did. Um, but I was, like, walking down the street and, like, you know, 15 people handed me flyers for hookers. And then I walked into the win and right on the on the right is a uh, Manolo Blahnik shoe store. Just, like, how are these things existing 20 feet from each other? Like, this is just, du- like, I don't understand how this works. It's like, it's a confusing it's so and weird, weird world, yeah. <laughs> and like even within the properties, like the how how much the rooms vary, the room types. I mean, on the same property can be selling thirty nine dollar rooms, but also have like seven hundred dollar suites. You know, hmm. last time I was in Vegas, I had just like a regular room uh, at the Golden Nugget. It was just a standard hotel room, yeah. nothing to write home about whatever it was bed that's all I cared about and friends of mine decided to splurge like a bunch of them splurged together on a suite and all of a sudden you get out of the elevator and it's like gold walls and chandeliers and their suite has like five bathrooms in it I'm just like wow how how does this exist yeah two stories up from where I'm staying in like a motel yeah crazy Mm -hmm. it's so weird and friends of mine who also like they actually got married in Vegas they love Vegas they were looking at there's their rooms I think it's the hard rock that have private pools yeah I'm just how like okay do your thing that's nuts but awesome that's pretty awesome now there there is Definitely something for everyone there and for every yeah. budget. Um, I've certainly never experienced any of the uh, kind of over the top. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've only really experienced lavishness. it by proxy. <laughs> yeah, I did get. Um, yeah, we'll talk about Vegas so many yeah. more times on the show. But I did before it uh, was demolished. Sadly, the Riviera. Um, one time when I was there on tours of property, shopping for p- uh, potential conference space. Um, got a tour of the Riviera and some of its secret rooms. And there was this whole like underground type thing where they had living quarters, like apartments basically, where like some of the mobsters used to live and stuff. Um, wow. Some of their like big high rollers from the, the 70s. Um, awesome. But yeah, these like secret, you know, multi-bedroom apartments below the Riviera. It was really cool. Weird. Yeah, I love the secret history of cities, too. That's awesome. Yeah, and Vegas definitely has an interesting history, but yeah. Well, we should probably wrap this episode up because we've we've talked people's ears (laughs) off and uh, a little little more than a a brief introduction of ourselves and what this show is. So, I mean, I guess guess what people can can glean from this is that the show is just going to be a clusterfuck of us like kind of talking about random things that pop out of our mouths and heads. 
Yeah, I feel like we'll pick a topic like Vegas and then just riff on that for an hour. And uh, yeah, just pick a topic and go. And I mean, I think ideally we do want to bring some interesting guests on. Between the two of us, we have a lot of interesting friends, some some really Um, fascinating and and weird and awesome people. So um, they can get on and kind of just kind of hang out and (laughs) drink and and talk about (laughs) this stuff with us too. And they will set the random topic of the day, and then we will just rant for a while about it. So, yeah. That's it'll pretty be, funny. Um, we should actually do that. We should, like, invite them on the show, and they'll say, well, what are we talking about? And I'll say, well, you know what? Yeah. Why don't you go ahead and pick it, and we'll talk yeah. about it, and it'll be totally yeah. What do you want to talk Let's about? Let's talk about Elmo Let's today. Let's there. Elmo, huh? Okay. Well, you know, interesting you mentioned that, because when I was in Vegas, I, I always see Elmo there, but usually I see him without his head on, and it's a short Mexican man. That creepy i've never seen a character without a head oh, and i Vegas, feel like they're it always would... wandering around without their heads because it's so hot <laughs> so you see these like really sleek like you know it's sad but they look like you know these dirty homeless people yeah. and you're all yeah and you see like i never get parents bringing their kids to vegas it's not a family vacation place people don't understand that but people always have their little but kids there and they're always like have kids there and they shuffling always them around hotels are like because i like i actually just just booked a night in Vegas for a couple weeks from now and like I was looking at this hotel and they're like you know family deals I'm like how are you saying like bachelor bachelorette parties sexy fun times family events I'm like I would never take my like not that I have children but where the casinos say like no one under 21 or whatever so they can't even go to the casino the parents want to go do something what do they do they're either bad parents and say you stay here in the room and don't make any noise we'll be back in a couple hours what are you gonna do like I last time when I was in Vegas, they can't do anything. You can't do anything. Bad Everyone's parenting. stuck. Bad parenting. And I was I was wandering down Fremont Street at like 2 a.m. And there was like a parent pushing a two-year-old in a stroller who was passed out. Like two-year-olds can sleep through anything. But I was just like, I don't know how I feel about this. On the one hand, like good on you for not coddling your child to death. But at the same time, like this feels weird. Yeah. No. A little weird. I love Vegas. I'm happy to, uh, you know, take anybody there and show them around. But uh not encouraging it for for kids and if you want to have fun at all and not be miserable in vegas and have a miserable vegas experience don't bring your kids so i did go to a hotel um so i was there for punk rock bowling in may and the tournament was at a hotel that was like way off the strip like we were all staying downtown and it was like a 30 minute bus ride wow. to this venue which is like super annoying but by the time you're going back you're drunk so it doesn't matter um but it was i forget what the name of this hotel was but it was like all in like everything there was like a water park inside the hotel and wow. bo- like it was it was the it was the destination for families because there was a casino but also like a pool so you send your kids to the pool you go gamble and you like reconvene for dinner it was just like this is weird but it's also the kind of like casino hotel that exists in like middle america yeah like it was such a weird, it was such a weird thing, and like so far from anything else in Vegas, it was odd. I mean, Circus Circus still exists on the Strip, and yeah. that's just a weird place. It's just I dirty and run down and sad. I've never been there. I've heard so much about it, and I've heard of it, like its role in the history of Vegas, but I've never wandered over there because I've I've been da- every time I've been there, and recently it's been downtown. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's a weird one. I haven't been there in years, but it's still there. Yep. Yep. It's it's all odd. It's all fun. All right. Well, let's wrap so, this up. I'm second out of beer. time around. I'm we out of beer. I so. also maybe that should be the rule: is once you're out of beer, you're out of podcast. <laughs> yeah. It's a good way to go. Yeah. We'll have to get the big ones. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> That'll be really fun, especially if you start doing a, an IPA or a stout with a high ABV. Yeah. Yeah. Be nice and toasted by the end of it. <laughs> smiles smiles all around um yeah well while we're doing this introduction in introductory episode um everything about this show is introductory and kind of off the cuff i guess so very much we're, so. we're, we're figuring out figuring it out as we go and uh in between drinks so um in the meantime until we figure things out and uh kind of feel things out and how we want it to go uh, from here on out um, we're just playing it by ear. So the best thing for you to do, uh, to find out when we're going to do this again, which will probably be soon, hopefully soon, yeah. um, follow us on social media. We're all over the place, but probably the easiest place, um, for you to see when we update would be Twitter. I am at acentric. That's A-C-E-C-E-N-T-R-I-C. And I am A-S-T vintage space. 
Yep. So yep. follow us there. Follow us there, and uh, we'll be sure to post when uh, the next show is coming up and anything related to the show and anything related to all the topics we talk about on this show. Yeah, and of course, if you guys who listen to this have any questions or comments or topics that you would like to hear us ramble about or guests that you would like to maybe see if we can manage to get on the show, definitely let us know on Twitter and we'll see what we can and absolutely cannot make happen, but hopefully can. <laughs> yeah, hopefully can. And uh, yeah, anything. We're we're pretty easygoing. Um, if you want us to talk about something stupid, we'll tell you you're stupid. No, we won't. We're nicer than that. But uh, if there's a beer you would like us to try and uh, give you our opinion on, we're happy to do that too. Yeah. Beer recommendations are a good one to crowdsource. Always for looking sure. for beer recommendations. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you everybody for listening. I uh, hope it hasn't been as crazy as I think it has been, but uh, we've certainly had fun. So that's important. Yeah. All right. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Cheers.